There's nothing I love more than authenticity, which is why I'm so excited about Salsa de la Vida hot sauce, which has been on kitchen tables in Mexico since 1956. It will be available here in the U.S. for purchase later this year. In addition to livening up your food, it's Mexican-owned, it's woman-owned, and it's one of the only hot sauce brands to have 100% Mexican sourced pepper mix. Salsa de la Vida hot sauce will be available here in the United States to purchase on shelves later this year. Hey there, I'm Leslie Levine Harvell. Welcome to Impolite Conversation, the podcast curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. I believe the best way to explore a topic in depth is to view it through multiple lenses. Join us as we explore race, culture, and societal issues through the lens of industry experts, writers, cultural critics, and HBCU students. We're beginning a new topic today called We Grew Here, You Flew Here. We're exploring how gentrification shapes the cultural landscape of communities and neighborhoods. I'm from New York, so when I hear the word gentrification, the first image that comes to mind is a building that has an elderly person in a rent control department and a much younger person living in the same building, but likely paying three times the amount. Clearly, gentrification is more complicated than the caricature I just described and more nuanced than the generational gap or the difference in rent between the people that grew there and the people that flew there. Our communities are comprised of people, but they're also comprised of mom and pop restaurants whose offerings reflect the various ethnicities of groups that have deep roots. Traditions such as go-go music blasting out of a speaker from the corner store or a weekly drum circle that convenes in the park. It's comprised of religious institutions and in some areas, historically black colleges and universities might also be part of your community. Obviously, this isn't an exhaustive list, right? Every community is different, but you get what I'm saying. Every neighborhood has a vibe and a personality that has been shaped over time by history and migration. So our conversation today is going to explore the indirect or the cultural displacement that happens over time in gentrified neighborhoods. Before we get into the cultural impact of gentrification, we're going to talk about what gentrification is on a very fundamental level. And who better to have this discussion with than Dr. Lance Friedman? Dr. Freeman is a professor in the urban planning program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. His research focuses on affordable housing, gentrification, ethnic and racial stratification in housing markets, and the relationship between the built environment and well-being. Professor Freeman teaches courses on community development, housing policy, and research methods. He also has professional experience working as a city planner for the New York City Housing Authority and as a budget analyst for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Dr. Freeman is also the author of the book, There Goes the Hood, Views of Gentrification from the Ground Up, and most recently, A Haven and a Hell, The Ghetto in Black America. I'm so glad Lance is joining us today. We do know that gentrification conjures very specific emotions, caricatures, I've seen people with T-shirts that say, I'm a gentrifier. It's definitely used as a noun. It's used as a verb. And people definitely have very strong emotions, good, bad. And on a very fundamental level, I would love for you to explain what it is and what set the historical stage for gentrification in the U.S. Sure. So so the term actually was coined by this British sociologist, uh, Ruth Glass, in the 1960s. She was describing older working class neighborhoods in London that at that time were experiencing an influx of young professionals into those neighborhoods. And they would move in and refurbish the housing and Different types of stores would open up to cater to them, and she referred to them as the gentry and the process of gentrification. So the term... What's the gentry? The gentry traditionally were considered the landed class, the the landowners, people of upper status in England. And so she was referring to them now as the gentry coming into these working class neighborhoods. And so the term across the Atlantic, it was attached to... Similar processes that were starting to take place in some cities in the United States, cities that were older, occupied by working class and poor, or in some instances, they were former factory districts. And the term was attached to the process here in the United States. 
In terms of what set the stage for it, I think it's the way cities evolved in the 20th century. Many cities developed during the industrial era. They were ports. They were places of manufacturing. They drew people to these locations to work in factories, to work on ports. Those types of industries, manufacturing, attracted working class individuals. In fact, much of the great migration of African-Americans from the South to the North was premised on them working in manufacturing districts. But you also have a large working class and low-income population. After World War II, that starts to change for a number of reasons. Manufacturing is being drawn to areas outside of the central city. The development of the interstate highway system, which makes it easier both for factories to ship their goods to different parts of the country, but also makes it easier for people who live in central cities to move to the suburban regions. And that's leaving in its wake a lot of underutilized manufacturing space. Think of a neighborhood like Soho in Manhattan. That used to be a manufacturing district, and now it's whatever you want to call it, hipster district. Williamsburg and Brooklyn also, Bushwick, parts of Bushwick. The federal government also helped people move to the suburbs, particularly white people, by using the Veterans Administration loans and Federal Housing Administration loans. Those were mortgages whereby the federal government would insure the mortgage. And so if, if the owner defaulted on the mortgage, the federal government would step in and pay it. And so banks were happy to make these mortgages to people because they knew they were going to get their money one way or the other. The FHA and the VA loans were... There were people that were excluded from those loans, correct? They were mostly for white people. African-Americans, for the most part, only got a very small percentage of those loans. And African-Americans could not use those loans to move into white neighborhoods right? because the banks would not lend them to move into a white neighborhood. And most Black neighborhoods were deemed to be too risky for the federal government to insure mortgages there. That's the process known as redlining, which dates back to the Great Depression. As I was doing research for this episode, I did see that there was this huge intersection between redlining and disinvestment. Because the last time we talked, you were part of our Impolite Conversation live event, right? Right. You always have all the answers. So this is very interesting. How long did redlining go on for? Well, as an official policy, it probably only occurred for about 30 years or so. It starts in the 1930s during the Great Depression, first being applied to the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was the entity that refinanced mortgages during the Great Depression for people whose houses were underwater. It subsequently was adopted by other federal agencies like the FHA loans and the VA loans. By the early 1960s, I think it was 1961, 1962, President Kennedy signs an executive order outlawing discrimination in all federal programs. So in theory, that should have had some influence on redlining or at least, you know, the explicit racial aspect of it, you would think. It wasn't really until the 1970s when community groups started pressuring banks to lend in these neighborhoods. And, and so you had the passage of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which again, officially forbade discrimination in mortgage lending. You also had the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. And what that did is it required banks to reveal where they were making their loans. So now you actually have data. You could see, oh, the banks are lending here, but they're not lending there. Prior to that, you just don't really know. And when were those passed? The Equal Credit Opportunity Act, I believe it was 1974, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, somewhere between 74 and 77. And then we also have the Community Reinvestment Act, which goes a step further. And it says that banks are required to lend in the same geographic areas where they're taking in deposits. Presumably, if people were able to easily access credit, then they would not have been organizing and protesting to get the government to pass the Community Reinvestment Act. Redlining lasted from the 1930s to the 1980s or so. 
I just want to make sure I'm following where the red line intersects with that, because I saw it come up in a lot of the literature. The intersection between redlining and gentrification. Even for white families, if they wanted to get a mortgage, it would be easier for them to do that if they moved to the suburbs as opposed to trying to stay in the city, right? So even if a white family did want to stay in the city, let's say they wanted to stay somewhere in Brooklyn, in most instances, it probably would have been more expensive. It would have been easier to get a mortgage in a new suburban subdivision in Long Island than in many neighborhoods in Brooklyn. There were many white neighborhoods that were redlined as well. There were actually four grades. So there was also a yellow category, which was the next stepped up from redlining. And so that was deemed as somewhat less risky, but still risky. If you look at a map of Brooklyn, most of it is red and yellow. The redlining contributed to disinvestments, most certainly in African-American neighborhoods. It also made it more difficult if whites wanted to purchase homes in, say, Brooklyn or in the inner central city. And so it's tilting the incentives for whites to leave the central city on top of the racism that would have motivated them from wanting to live amongst Blacks. The financial incentives were being tilted for them to move towards the suburbs. So that's setting the stage. I've talked about the changes in the economy. On the one hand, deindustrialization. I talked about federal policy that's contributing to that. There were some other changes that happened as well. There were cultural changes. You know, the 60s is the rise of the countercultural movement, the hippies and what have you. Accompanying that, for many people, was also a change in taste in terms of the types of neighborhoods they wanted to live in. You know, some people viewed the suburbs as, you know, homogenous and boring. And, conformity. Yeah, as sites of conformity. And they looked at older, essential urban neighborhoods as more authentic. And so you see some change. More edgy. Yes. You see some change in cultural <laughs> taste. Different types of economic activity were starting to grow take into consideration New York or San Francisco. There you see industries like finance, Wall Street, or advertising on the West Coast, information technology. Those types of businesses tend to thrive in dense central business districts. That's also bringing with that a population of young professionals who are going to look for housing, and that's going to contribute to that. And then the last point I'll point to is public policy. Local governments, they rely on either the property taxes and to a lesser extent sales taxes to fund their services. And so they like gentrification. They like people coming in who are earning higher incomes, they're paying more in the way of sales taxes. And so they put together various schemes that encourage gentrification, whether it's through urban renewal or other types of initiatives all with the aim of attracting more high-income households and less low-income households who tend to be viewed as more of a drain on the fiscal treasury. Can you talk a little bit about urban renewal? What happens is the government would step in and condemn the properties and say, well, this area is blighted, so we're going to condemn it. So they basically buy the land from the owners and they transfer it to a private developer who then redevelops it into something else. There are a number of projects around New York City, uh, Atlantic Yards. Lincoln Center is an urban renewal project, right? Lincoln Center is another example. That area you said used to be a traditionally Black neighborhood. Right. Dating back to the turn of the last century, that area south of there used to be part of what's known as San Juan Hill which prior to Harlem being the center of Black life in New York City, that area was. And that was the case probably up until at least the 1950s. There were several urban renewal projects in that area, you know, including Lincoln Center, Columbus Circle Development, and there's a couple of public housing developments there, I believe, as well. But that's actually an interesting tidbit. I'm going to circle back to that. While this conversation is going to be about the cultural displacement that happens during gentrification, I don't want to completely ignore or not make mention of the physical displacement that occurs. It probably seems like we are spending a lot of time on historical things, but I do think that it's important to not just look at something in a vacuum. So according to a study done by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, they found that between 2000 and 2013, seven cities accounted for nearly half of the gentrification nationally. 
New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Baltimore, San Diego, and Chicago. Displacement of Black and Hispanic residents accompanied gentrification in many places and impacted at least 135,000 people in their study period. It does seem, as I was reading about this, that it's up to debate as to whether or not mass physical displacement is a direct outcome of gentrification. Lance, does gentrification actually cause mass physical displacement of longtime residents, or is that a myth? Displacement certainly occurs, but when you look at the data, you do have instances of neighborhoods experiencing gentrification where you don't see widespread physical displacement. And I think what's happening is that, unfortunately or tragically, in many low-income neighborhoods of color, you have a lot of residential instability. Matthew Desmond has an excellent book called Evicted, where he chronicles this process in Milwaukee. There's a lot of churning in these neighborhoods, as the title of his book implies, people are being evicted. These are neighborhoods that are not experiencing any gentrification. These are low-income neighborhoods. The problem is their incomes are insufficient and unstable, and that's what's leading to all the churning. You see that in other low-income neighborhoods as well. And so what's happening at the low end of the housing market, there's a lot of residential instability People's incomes are not sufficient to provide them with security. And so when gentrification starts to happen, it doesn't alter that dynamic in the way I think a lot of people expect, which is that people are now being forced to move more frequently. What it does, though, is it kind of alters who's able to move into these neighborhoods. In the past, all this residential instability was already occurring in many low-income neighborhoods. When people would move, they would be replaced by another low-income person of color. And then if the person did move, they might move a few blocks away or within the same community. Now what's happening when people move, they're being replaced by higher-income households. And when people do move, they're probably less likely to stay within these neighborhoods. And that is something that is due to gentrification. More impolite conversation in just a moment. The new HBO documentary Yusuf Hawkins' Storm Over Brooklyn tells the story of Yusuf Hawkins, a black teenager who was murdered in 1989 by a group of young white men in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. His death and the official response to it sparked outrage in New York. The film, directed by Muta Ali Muhammad, explores the 30-year legacy of Yusuf's murder and his family and friends reflect on the tragedy and the subsequent fight for justice that inspired and divided New York City. Stream it now on HBO Max. Visit hbomax.com to sign up for your seven-day free trial. Okay, so it's multifactorial. I think that when mainstream conversation happens around gentrification, it's really centered in the physical displacement. I think it's so important to talk about the cultural displacement that happens. Despite what the mainstream narrative is, and you explored that in your first book, There Goes the Hood, views the gentrification from the ground up. Longtime residents are actually very, very receptive and optimistic about gentrification. I mean, why wouldn't they? It brings their neighborhoods into the mainstream of American commercial life. Their neighborhood begins to receive amenities and services that others might take for granted. And it also represents the possibility of achieving upward mobility. Yet at the same time, They're also pessimistic and distrustful, and that is really rooted in the long history of the prolonged disinvestment and redlining in their communities. So there's a paradox there. So keeping in mind this lens of viewing gentrification through the lens of intentional investment after prolonged disinvestment, which happened along racial lines, it brings me to the topic of cultural displacement. I do think that without empirical data, We know that this is an actual problem. You brought up this neighborhood of San Juan Hill. Thank you for bringing that up. And it's funny because as you were talking, I was like, you know what? Let me Google this. The 1940 census revealed its residents were mostly African-American, African-Caribbean, and Puerto Rican. This is according to Untapped New York. 
It was home to some of New York's liveliest jazz joints, including the Jungles Casino. This is the club where in 1913, the pianist James P. Johnson wrote a tune to accompany the wild and comical dance that resulted in the Charleston, which was the biggest dance craze of the 20th century. Decades later, San Juan Hill was home to Thelonious Monk. They talk about how basically there was a developer who was approached and then there you go. Really, San Juan Hill is kind of a case study in what not to do. I think that looking at that as a model, it's really interesting to think about what that means for the cultural landscape of other neighborhoods if we look at San Juan Hill. There was a study that was published in December of 2019 in the International Journal for Environmental Research and Public Health entitled Beyond Housing. One of the things that they brought up is that since gentrification can change the feel of a neighborhood by refashioning spaces in ways that cater to a selective few, neighborhoods can feel unwelcoming even for longtime residents. The establishment of new shops that feature expensive food or clothing, for example, convey implicit messages about who can and should enter these spaces. In fact, a recent study finds that existing residents in gentrifying communities report feeling suddenly unwelcome in public spaces, playgrounds, and green spaces that should be accessible to everyone. Sometimes it results in a conflict. There's a well-known example of the African drumming that used to occur in Harlem, right? You have that example where I think dating back to the 1970s, people would get together and drum in Marcus Garvey Park. Around the turn of the century, as Harlem started to experience gentrification and people were moving into brownstones around the park or new condominiums or towers that were opening up near the park, some of the people that were coming in started to complain that the drums are noisy and there was a conflict, a clash over that. There was a similar dynamic in Washington, D.C. There was a cell phone store. I think that dates back to the 1990s as the neighborhood gentrified. People, so at least one person anyway, complained about the, the music that was being played. We're actually going to be talking to some Howard University students about that. Did you go to HBCU? What? I went to Spelman, the Spelman College. How did we not ever talk about this? So I like Bleed Spelman Blue. So I'm like, oh, okay, wait a minute, how did he great. not know? Wait a minute. I mean, those are just two you know, well-known examples. The gentrification is bringing in people with different customs, different ideas about how public space should be used. They might think it's okay to let your dogs run around the park off a leash. Other people are like, well, you know, your dog should be on a leash in a public park anyway, right? You have those conflicts. The conflicts are what captures our attention, but there are certainly more subtle changes that are happening that don't necessarily lead to conflict, but they're changing. I think that feeling welcome in a place is a very important part of well-being. Right. People don't feel like they belong there anymore. We know this goes beyond public spaces, right? This also pertains to places of belonging, such as a community-run business, neighborhoods, cultural centers, historic institutions. And in many communities, they may be one and the same thing. In San Francisco, community leaders in Chinatown are worried about the fact that their banquet hall restaurants keep closing and are being reopened as upscale restaurants. And just to be clear, these banquet halls, they're not just restaurants. In Chinatown, they functioned as community centers and they had five of them. And according to the San Francisco Chronicle, of the five, there are only two remaining. One of them, Four Seas, which was the original banquet hall community center, it was replaced by Mr. Jews, which is a Michelin starred restaurant. And we don't know the price point there, but we can make our best guess. And then a year later, Gold Mountain, which was another one of these banquet halls, was replaced by the China Live Complex, which includes a $225 tasting menu. And then Empress of China, which closed in 2014, is going to be reopened by the former international executive chef of the Cantonese restaurant chain, Hakkasan. And I think that also touches on another myth, too, which is that all gentrifiers are white. So in this case of San Francisco, you have Chinatown these banquet halls being closed down and reopened as inaccessible to the masses. Asian restaurants, when you think about that, you have to really think about how to properly do these things. And I wonder, would there have been a way to 
gentrify San Juan Hill so that Lincoln Center, which is an amazing institution where cultural exchange happens, could that have happened as well as maintaining these residents and the culture and the jazz joints and the culture that came out of the Caribbeans and the African-Americans and all those people that live there? Could those things have coexisted? Yeah, that's a great question and something I've thought about and have been asked about that would apply to not just that neighborhood, but other neighborhoods that are experiencing what San Juan Hill experienced. You know, you have Thelonious Monk walking around and getting his inspiration. Could those things have coexisted in an intentional way? More effort could have been put into helping people be able to afford to stay in the community. They could have done the redevelopment process in a way that was more sensitive towards people who would want to stay in the community, they could have done it in a more sensitive way. Instead of just bulldozing the whole area and displacing everybody, they could have done it in phases so that people who wanted to stay perhaps could have relocated to the parts of the neighborhood that had not been demolished yet. And they could have built a broader range of housing in addition to public housing. When you said that San Juan Hill the area near Lincoln Center, when you said that it was the center of Black life before Harlem, it's like you're from another planet, like talking to me about that, because that area has no semblance that there was ever a centering of Black life. I would love for you to touch on, in your 2016 opinion piece published by the Washington Post entitled The Five Myths of Gentrification, You mentioned that one of the myths of gentrification is that gentrifiers are white. Why is it important to make note of the fact that not all gentrifiers are white? Well, it just helps us to understand the process. To keep in mind that class is a significant component of the gentrification process. In the 1970s and 1980s, there were efforts by people in Harlem to try to attract more of the Black middle class to Harlem. And there was some success in that. Some Blacks did purchase brownstones there and refurbish them and what have you. Some people could might even say Blacks were sort of in the vanguard of gentrification in Harlem. You know, I have a couple of uncles who grew up in Harlem and they had subsequently moved to Queens. But then later on in the 80s, they had purchased brownstones in Harlem. They probably don't fit the stereotypical image of gentrifiers, but they were, by that time, they could afford to buy brownstones, although they weren't that expensive at the time. But still, you know, they were reinvesting in the neighborhood and and they had no longer lived there anymore, even though they grew up there. We do know, though, that many Blacks were moving to Harlem. And part of the challenge, too, is neighborhoods do change. Harlem is no longer the center of of Black cultural life the way it was in the first part of the 20th century. Many younger Blacks might look at other places as meccas that they're drawn to, maybe like Atlanta or something like that. You do need that. That's part of what made Harlem dynamic and exciting in the early part of the 20th century. People from throughout the African diaspora were drawn there. That's part of what made it exciting. To what extent is that still the case, right? For for Harlem to have retained that same role that it played in the early 20th century, it still would have to draw Blacks from around the globe to want to come there because they think it's someplace they want to be. That part is, is more challenging, I think. How do you do that? How do you create that cultural milieu that will draw people from around the globe? That part is really harder. If you're trying to create this sort of mecca of what San Juan Hill was, otherwise you kind of wind up with what's happening in Chinatown, or you look in New York City, you look at Little Italy. Little Italy still exists, but really it's kind of like a museum feel. That all makes sense. Gentrification has a lot of benefits. It's going to bring up the property value. You're going to have amenities that come in. This idea that you can both gentrify a neighborhood, bring it into modern times, ensure that residents are not culturally displaced in the process and allow it to retain the identity that makes it edgy and, you know, interesting. Like I said, the last time we chatted, it was Impolite Conversation and Pretty Mystery, which is a chef based in Oakland. 
she made an interesting comment, which is that there's a difference between a gentrifier and a colonizer. When I think of the term colonization, it's I'm coming here and I am going to change everything so that it reflects me. The Netflix show Hensified actually touches on this. And the show focuses on a family in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of East Los Angeles, which is a historic Latinx community. And the idea behind Hentification is that a neighborhood can both retain its Latino identity while bringing in economic development and ensuring that residents are not displaced in the process. There has to be some way that you can do that. I don't think there's any one single way to do it, but I do think it's very important that people in the community have buy-in and have power or influence in terms of what's going to happen in their community. That's the most important thing for the people in the community to feel like, hey, we want to influence what's going to happen, and we do have some influence over what's going to happen. And then I think with that, they can think about What do they want? How do they envision the future of their community? I think that based off of the conversation that we're having and a lot of the data that I've read, which is that term gentrification evokes negative emotions. I think we understand sort of why, but I think maybe we need to take some of the emotion out of that word and just think about it for what it is. Can you remind us of the name of your most recent book and where people can purchase it? It's A Haven and a Hell, The Ghetto in Black America. It's uh, published by Columbia University Press. I know you can get it online, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. You know that my event series is called The Iconoclast Dinner Experience. One of the questions I always like to ask my guests, if it were your last night on Earth, what city would you eat in? Oh, probably New York. Are you a native New Yorker? I am. Uh, I grew up in Queens. Since you are a native New Yorker, I'm going to dig deeper into this question. What neighborhood are you eating in? I really like pizza. So someplace that has really good pizza. I like it. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. You have shared a lot of really interesting information, dispelling myths about gentrification, and also really actionable ways that gentrification can take place while also retaining its identity. Thank you for listening to Impolite Conversation, the podcast curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Icon Dinner and on the Iconoclast Dinner Experience Facebook page. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Hit us on socials or send us feedback at press at iconoclastdinner.com. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our podcast and we'd also love it if you rated and reviewed us. Join us on Friday for our On the Yard and Polite Conversation.